Um, welcome everyone to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the eighth meeting of 2015. I can ask you to set any electronic devices to flight mode or switch off, please. I'd like to start with introductions. We're supported at the table by the clerking and research staff, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by the security office, and welcome to observers in the public gallery. My name is Margaret McCulloch, and I'm the committee's convener, and members will now introduce themselves, starting here on my right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow, Kelvin, and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Matt Pagh, good morning. John Finney, MSP, Highlands and Islands. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow, Shettleston. Good morning, Christian Arad, MSP for the North East of Scotland. Good morning, Annabelle Gould, the MSP for the West of Scotland. And apologies for Jane Baxter, who's unable to attend this morning. The first item um, is a decision on taking business in private. Members are asked to agree to take item three in private, which is consideration of petition PE1372 by Friends of the Earth Scotland on access to justice on environmental matters. The reason for this is that we will be discussing legal advice. Are we agreed? John. I know the committee wants to be open and transparent, and, and I understand the protocol that, that uh, has you asking for this matter to be considered in private. I am content that that is the, the position, given the, the long-standing protocol. However, this matter has been on the agenda from almost day one of, of this, this committee in the session. And it is a manifesto commitment of the party of government, so I'm hoping we're going to see some action today rather than just okay. more words. Yeah. So can we agree that we will actually hold this session in private then? Yep, agreed. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is an evidence session on our inquiry into age and social isolation. I welcome the panel and can ask witnesses to introduce themselves and can I also invite witnesses to outline briefly their current work. And can I start with you, Joe, please? I'm uh, Joe McElhom, Manager for Older Adult Services in North Lanarkshire Council and in that capacity I have responsibility for the strategic and operational management of um, older adult services across the council, including um, areas relevant to the um, subject today. Jane. Hello, I'm Jane Kellock. I'm Interim Head of Social Policy with West Lothian Council. Um, social Policy, in partnership with other council service areas, delivers a wide range of social work and social care services. Um, we cover children, young people and their families, adults and older people and carers, and criminal justice service area also. Um, the, the services that we provide are mainly targeted to people who are made more vulnerable by um, their age, their health and life circumstances. Thank you. David? Hi, good morning, I'm David Rowland. I'm Head of Health and Community Care with the newly formed North Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership. Uh, within that role, I have responsibility for all community health services in North Ayrshire and for adult and older people's social work services and for the planning and delivery of those services, very closely linking with the third sector and independent sector as well. Thank you. Hello, I'm Yvette Burgess. I'm Unit Director of the Housing Support Enabling Unit and I'm here today representing the Housing Coordinating Group this is a group that was formed a couple of years ago, um, bringing together various housing organisations, including Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Charters Institute of Housing, um, Care and Repair Scotland, um, various housing organisations, including also Association of Local Chief Housing Officers. So what we're trying to do is bring a coordinated voice to uh, the housing world cross-sector. Uh, I'm Graham Watt. I'm Professor of General Practice at Glasgow University. I've spent a lot of time working with the uh, deep end practices, which are the 100 most deprived practices in Scotland. Thank you very much. Um, we've actually heard that there's a range of factors can actually contribute to social isolation and loneliness amongst older and younger people. Uh, for example, poverty, bereavement and mental illness. Um, and we've also heard that feeling being socially isolated and lonely can have really quite an impact, significant impact on the individuals. Can you actually explain to me or tell me, is the impact of social isolation understood clearly among social providers in health, social work and housing? Are they aware of it? And if so, what sort of action do they actually take when it's identified? Who would like to start? Answer first. 
David, you're smiling or picking you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, in all honesty, I think we're beginning to scratch the surface. Um, I, I think there's, there's an understanding that um, social isolation is a, is a major issue. Um, it affects the, the health and well-being of the individuals who, who experience it. Um, I don't think we are as good as we, we should be at identifying individuals who are um, suffering from or struggling with social isolation. And therefore, I don't think we make the connections particularly well for those individuals in terms of how we might address the issues that they face. Um, I think there's a variety of things that we can do to get better at that. Um, I think if we, if we understand um, how and why individuals use our services um, in a particular way, then we might have a better understanding of, 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 of those who are actually facing social isolation and then be able to make the connections that, that we need. If I give you an example, um, I was looking at our recent data for people who have used our community alarm systems in North Ayrshire. And there's, there's a very small number of individuals who use the community alarms three, four, five times a day um, over the course of a month. Um, and, and sitting behind that, there, there are sometimes a small number of, of, of issues that are genuine and need to be addressed. Um, but sometimes it's, it's more about just making contact and just looking for a bit of reassurance that they're OK. And I'm very keen that we use that data in a very different way going forward so that we do begin to understand um, the true needs of the individuals who are using the alarm system in that way. Um, we are undertaking a review of our care at home service and I'm very keen that as part of that we look towards um, how we can provide a, a, um, something that's more than just a befriending service, something that is a bit of reassurance to, to local people who are perhaps living alone and feeling vulnerable and isolated. But for me, it's all about digging beneath the, the traditional data sets that we have and understanding what's actually happening be behind all of that and using that in a very positive way. Thank you. Anyone else like to come in on that? Graham. Um, um, I think we need to steer clear of uh, defining socialisation or loneliness as a problem which people either have or haven't got uh, as something which professionals identify and somehow process and solve. I think that's not a good way of uh, approaching it. Individuals are very uh, unique in terms of their circumstances. I think statutory services are limited in what they can do to address societal problems in terms of the, the loss of institutional activity, whether it's through work, uh, trade unions, church, even even family. I mean, uh, all those things have, have to be replaced by a, a different type of social institution which gives a people a role and a purpose in their, their, their lives. Um, the one institution that, that, that still works in terms of connectedness, I think, is, is the health service because by, by virtue of the health problems that people have either at a young age uh, or an old age, they will have contact with the health service and that's uh, a really important r resource. I mean, the strengths of the health system that we've got are within general practice. There's contact, not just contact, but continuity of contact and coverage, so everybody's included, uh, you know, with the exception of the post office, nobody else has got that in quite the same degree. It's not uh, exclusive to general practice, it's not consistent within general practice, but it's a huge important resource, the contact, the continuity and the coverage, because what comes from that is cumulative knowledge of individuals and communities which can't be known elsewhere. Uh, I think one of the challenges is to uh, share resource uh, differently so that uh, power, resource and responsibility are actually more based in communities because only people who work in communities, particularly the streetwise people who work within primary health care teams, are able to imagine how things could be uh, improved. I think what uh, uh, everybody needs, especially when they get older, is a small number of professionals uh, whom they know and trust uh, who will see them as individuals, not as problems, and are then in a position to do something about it. Uh, I can hope I'll get the opportunity to talk later about the problems within the system, mm -hmm. but essentially uh, the system that I described with continuity, contact and coverage needs to be better connected with a whole lot of other resources within the community, especially in the, in the third sector. Uh, you know, building all those relationships is a task, 
uh, and just as you build up a relationship with patients over time, the relationships between agencies within communities have to have their own trust and knowledge and experience. Uh, my view would be that in many ways the, the health service needs to be reimagined as a social institution which addresses the problems of the future rather than what it's currently doing, which is continuing to operate on a kind of a rescue uh, 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 in dire straits uh, mode. The centre of gravity needs to shift away from out-of-hours uh, accidents and emergency hospital beds to upstream in the community, helping people to live uh, well and long uh, with uh, um, uh, whatever problems they have. And uh, healthcare obviously isn't the solution to that, but it's strategically very importantly placed. It's a huge resource that we don't have anywhere else. And I think the danger is that we, we have taken it for granted somewhat, and it's in rather a weak position in order to address the challenges that are clearly lying ahead. Thank you. Joe? I would endorse uh, both the previous contributions and the connect that the um, that, that we we don't currently identify you know people who who could in fact be connected and be be better supported and in fact GPs GP practices quite often will in fact be in touch with people in the other place in terms of just as an example in terms of NHS is that there are. Um, pressures in emergency department and some of those pressures are actually related to people who, who turn up at the emergency department in the hospital on a very frequent basis and actually they're there because they've, they are actually feeling isolated, there is a kind of a, an issue of loneliness and they've established a pattern of going there but in fact what we don't then do is uh, find alternative um, a, a approaches and the third sector is vitally important in that so you know, an example uh, from um, North Lanark, or from uh, uh, the Lanark partnership area, is that in the acute hospitals we have used reshaping care money and have continued that uh, to create a post where uh, the third sector actually have a presence in the hospital, and they. Uh, th so it's just one post, but th th that one person has demonstrated already, you know, the effectiveness in terms of connecting many, many people who are, who are who have been coming through the hospital, social isolation identified as an issue for them, but now we're actually able to pick that up because the statutory services uh, currently are not, you know, and, and probably can't even in the longer term take over that responsibility, but an emphasis on prevention, early intervention, in, uh, where we connect the third, the third sector is, is really important part of what, we're, what we need to do here. Thanks. Uh, Annabel? Provided to the mm -hmm. committee, Mr. McElhom, about that. Yeah, yeah. It'd be quite interesting to know um, if the people that were coming along where they would be referred to, and I don't know if you would have a pattern of how often they actually turned up, and once they were referred, did they actually stop coming to the hospital? I don't know if that's too much detail, but that would be quite interesting to see how effective that is. Yeah, we, we can obtain a report yeah. for the committee yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yvette. Um, just briefly, I wanted to mention the role of housing, because although we're talking about health and social care, I'm very conscious that people who are homeless, young people who are homeless, older people who are looking to move, they're coming into contact with housing organisations, and frontline housing staff are often well-placed to be identifying isolation, certainly, and loneliness, and in some cases, in many cases, housing associations, but also local housing departments are delivering activities and other types of services that help to combat that and also help to prevent it, as we've been hearing, moving upstream um, before it gets to the stage where people are lonely and not getting out, not getting to the services that they need uh, before that gets to a problem. These other um, housing organisations are well placed to either connect with voluntary services or to provide them themselves. Do, does the housing organisations actually give staff training to the staff to raise this as part of an awareness for them when they actually go in and, and, and speak to people and meet people? Is it, is it on their radar to identify it? I think, as we've been hearing, that um, issues about isolation and loneliness don't tend to occur um, on the, in themselves. It will be there'll be issues about homelessness, about social connection, social networks. There's an increasing recognition about the importance of social networks in helping people to be resilient during times of transition and change. But to answer your question about 
training, then I think it's very much part of the way that frontline services are um, increasingly thinking. But I think probably the issue is that it's, there's not always an awareness about how to deal with it and where the services are locally that people should be referred to. And I'm sure there is an issue there about making sure up-to-date information is available. Thank you very much. Jane, do you like to come in? Yes, I certainly agree. It's a whole system. approach that we need to take to, um, to tackling social isolation. But um, I suppose it, 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 and I see it more as, as a societal issue. Um, and uh, really the, the, the issue for me is that everyone requires to be socially connected. That's part of our, our human condition. So when systems break down in such a way that we disconnect from others or when life circumstances um, come along that uh, where we lose people that we're close to, then we need to be able to respond to that in a very human way and not stigmatise people or, or further isolate them by, um, you know, by, by treating them as if there was something wrong with them as, a, as an individual. So I do think that, that we all, all the agencies in the, in the partnerships that we have around the country need to be responsive to that and to look to um, the structures of, of how we deliver services, the way that we make contact with people, the way that we speak to them on an individual basis, all of that's very important in terms of being able to um, to keep to keep our communities connected. So. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to Sandra now. Uh, thank you very much, Kavira. Uh, very interesting issues that came out of that particular question. We know there's services out there, but the problem is is people being able to find them and the hard reach, basically trying to uh, bring them forward. And uh, uh, Graham had mentioned the fact about, and I think Joe also. Uh, the fact about strategy services and perhaps having to be replaced by something else. Now, there's there's two that, that I'm very familiar with, and it's a links programme, which obviously others had, had mentioned, and basically how we actually try and get the aims of the links programme out to the hard-to-reach people. And then there's a deep end practice, which when I was on audit committee, we actually went out and looked at the deep end practice, which obviously got to people in disadvantaged areas. But how do the services which are provided by yourselves and obviously the link programme and TPEN practice, how do they reach out to the folk who are not aware that the services are, are there? Is it, a difficult, is it difficult to do? Graham? Um, I, I'm never comfortable with the phrase hard to reach. Sometimes it's, it's recognised as being a synonym for easy to ignore. Uh, I mean, often we do have contact. It's what happens or doesn't happen with the contact that's, that's the issue. Uh, that's certainly the, the case in deep end practices, which have plenty of contact with patients, uh, but often lack the resources, uh, time within consultations and links to other services in order to address needs. So there's a big sort of mountain of unmet need there. Um, gosh, Sandra, you asked so many <laughs> questions, we could spend the, the whole <laughs> morning. I th links is... is, um, is uh, a, a, an important and very topical development. Um, there's a story behind it. Uh, we started off in the deep end asking practices uh, to what extent they were involved in social prescribing, which was using local community resources. And practices varied in what they knew, because in the last 10 years, general practice has become very introspective for all sorts of reasons and hasn't been looking out. Uh, but then we moved on with the, the, the government support to do a links project, which was trying to build on that. And then there was a project called the Bridge Project in three practices, which sought to link a practice's knowledge of elderly patients with community resources for social and physical activity. Uh, and there's a very interesting, two interesting things were learnt from that. Uh, one was every locality is different. So it has to be imagined and developed locally. It can't be done from a, a, a centre. But an anecdote, a, a GP in Rochese identified six elderly patients whom, whom she thought would be ideal for this, uh, none of whom thought it was a good idea. Uh, and uh, I think that just makes the point that um, this isn't simply a question of shifting people along. Uh, there's a relationship and a person. And the important thing is that because... She's working in general practice. It wasn't a, 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 a once and for all opportunity. The relationship exists and it can be returned to. So although the link 
to community resources didn't happen then. It's a bit like smoking. I mean, sometimes everybody wants to give up smoking, but sometimes not, they're not ready for it. So you, you, you come back to it in six months' time. It's important to have the continuity and to have a service which has the flexibility to work in that way. If you have an outreach programme where everything is determined by somebody whose job it is to, to go out, then you may lose that, that, that flexibility. Um, that's gone on to um, uh, the Link Worker programme, which government is sponsoring and evaluating in, in seven practices, which implants a, a community links practitioner within general practices, all in the, the deep end. Uh, their job is to do what their practices can't do, which is to spend time um, making links with the community resources and uh, the practices are finding their own ways of using those links. Uh, um, there's an important issue there. It's not just about information. I mean, some people just need information to be signposted. You know, there are people with agency and, uh, and education who just need to know where something is and they'll go and find it. Um, but particularly in deprived areas, people often lack the knowledge, the articulacy, the agency to do that. Uh, especially if it's compounded by mental health problems, which are twice as common in deprived areas. Uh, the, uh, many people have attachment issues. Their whole life, because of emotional damage early on, is characterised by difficulties of attachment, uh, never mind with services, but with friends and, and family. They, are, they need a, a long-term relationship to make a bit of progress. Uh, so it's, it's not just links and signposts and information, it's relationships uh, over a period of time. Um, the, uh, interestingly, uh, my understanding is that a lot of what the link workers do is, is not signposting. It's helping patients who are floundering, uh, dealing with rather impersonal, dysfunctional, fragmented services the way that services are configured often makes it very difficult for patients to find a way around them, especially have, if they have more than one problem. Uh, so that's called the treatment burden. Uh, and I always have a slight worry with the Links Worker Initiative that it's not addressing the fundamental problem, which is that services are so fragmented and dysfunctional and impersonal and difficult for some patients to find their way around. If you have a link worker in, you may solve it for the individual patient without solving the system problem. Um, but I think that it's, it, it's early days, the link worker an initiative. Uh, in a sense, every practice should have one, um, but it is an expensive solution, so every practice couldn't have one. The challenge is to translate what's being learnt through that project into something that is sustainable at every level. Uh, and essentially that's um, uh, building uh, social relationships within local communities, not necessarily with expensive professional salaries. That's un unaffordable. Uh, and because of what I said about the, the, the contact and the continuity and the coverage, general practice is a very good place to, to start. But it's, but it's not a good place at the moment because it's under such pressure. Uh, I can talk about that more if you wish. <laughs> Thank you. I presume what you're saying is it's great, but it shouldn't just all be down to general practitioners. There's other ways of doing it. Yeah. I think I don't know if anyone wanted, else wanted to come in, but David had mentioned earlier in regards to joined up. I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, I did, you did mention the word links, uh, but you did mention the fact about working, uh, you know, together in an alliance type thing. And I think housing and every other aspect is very important and it should be more joined up. It's how we get to the joined up part of it. And I just wondered if you had any ideas or comments in regards to that. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, there's, there's two bits of work that we're looking to take forward this year. Um, Part of it mirrors some of what Graham's just described in terms of recognising the importance of, of, of general practice and the universality of general practice, but they need to support general practice. So we, we are putting um, connector posts in to six GP practices in North Ayrshire this year to trial precisely that, that links type model. But Graham's absolutely right as well. In itself, I don't think it's sustainable. 
So part of that role has to be about beginning to build community capacity and community resilience so that over time we begin to develop that community network that people know and understand and understand how to engage with so that it becomes um, sustainable over time. Um, the other bit of work that we're, we're doing just now relates very much to um, the, the housing side of things. And we, we are just starting a, a major refurb programme in terms of our sheltered housing. And within each of the sheltered housing um, refurbs, there will be a community hub developed. And we're looking to develop alliances with the, the third sector to begin to work with local communities to design the services that will actually go into those hubs. Working firstly with the residents so that we understand which services they want, so we get that connectedness within the complex itself, but then reaching out to the community as well to say, how do we make the, the, these facilities community-based um, centres, community-based hubs for, for connecting um, the, the individuals who live on their own within these facilities, with individuals who live on their own or with others out in the wider community. And I think it is about making those connections at a number of levels. I think GP practice, Graham's right, is, is absolutely key, but it's about finding other ways to sustain that in the wider community as well. Okay. Joe, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I think I mean, it's interesting what Graham's saying, about that the link workers are involved in helping people navigate you know, the complexity of a service system, and that would suggest the link workers are dealing with people who actually are very much involved with services. And I, I think a, a, a large area of concern for the committee for the report that you're producing is around people who are not involved in services and how do we actually work in that more preventive way. Um, we redesigned uh, day services for older people in uh, North Lanarkshire. There was, a, was a quite a complex redesign. I won't go into all the details of that, but one of the things that we did uh, was we we recognised that we had many many people who were being referred to a traditional day centre model, and when you asked why were they being referred, it was because they were lonely. You know, so 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 our systems drew them into referral to a day centre. So as part of the redesign program, we interviewed uh, you, you know quite a big cross section of the people on that waiting list and, and um, th asked them what did they want in their lives, and not one person said they wanted to go to a day centre. You know, they they they, they said they, they they you know all sorts of different things. You know, resuming the capacity to go for a pub lunch or, you know, a bowling club or getting back to church. You know, so uh, part of the redesign that we did was we we took some of the posts and changed them into what perhaps I don't know enough about the links program in the GP practice, but but it, it, these are roles of locality link officer. So now when people are referred and the only reason that they're coming into the formal system is because of loneliness, then what we are offering is that the locality link officer speaks to them about what is in their area that could actually meet some of the things that they want to aspire to in their lives. And that the turnover in that, the, the number of people they see is really quite significant. And as we then develop that, we also became aware that having identified the opportunity for the person, many people said, I can't actually access that opportunity for reasons to do with, for example, transport, or I need a carer, or perhaps for a very, very small intervention, simply to get from my house into a taxi, I need a carer, and from a, the taxi into the centre or into the, the, the lunch or wherever. Um, I don't need somebody there all the time, but these are the things that are stopping us. So we then actually created um, a post of locality support officer who, whose job it is to actually provide those very small interventions. And what that has done, you know, that actually then creates the opportunity for that person to be connected into the life of their community. And clearly also what it does, it, prevent, it, it removes the need for them to be involved in formal services. And it means that the formal service is actually able to concentrate on people who have very high levels of need. Really. Can, I, mm -hmm. can I just come in very briefly on that? I mean, you're really talking about person-centred care. Um, everybody's talking about that, really talking about the individual and, and sort of structuring the, the help and support and the care around the individual. But when you questioned the group of people or the individual, whoever was actually questioning, did anybody ask them, were they lonely or were they isolated? Um, because we've actually heard as well that people don't like to use the word <coughs> lonely and isolated. Uh, it's, it might be a feeling of failure the, uh, or they're sort of typecast, they don't, they don't want to actually use the word, but 
where they are, ask that question, are you lonely? Have you been lonely? And would this help? Um, the, I mean, certainly we were talking to people about that, you know, the specific, you know, format of those interviews. It's a little while ago now, so I'm not sure I can, can recall that, Margaret. But certainly the reason that was identified, you know, an on reason for referral, you know, this was what was identified. And quite often it's people who do did have some, you know, care need or difficulty about getting out of the house and their carer was feeling unsupported and wasn't getting a break. And, uh, you know, so the, the connection, pe people talk about wanting to actually have the activity that they had in their life before, you know, the thing that they miss in their life before, following a bereavement, you know, things that they did with, with the, the partner who has, who's deceased that, that got lost. In, in, the, in the grieving process and were never resumed afterwards. It's, so, so people will um, articulate it in that, in that way, I think. Thank you, Sandra. Just, just a small follow-up question. <coughs> in the, I think, you know, basically bringing the voluntary third sector into, I say care, sheltered housing, build, etc. I think someone's going to ask a question on that later on anyway, so I think that's a, an interesting prospect. I was interested in, in, Joe, what you said. I take it that this new service that the council has is complementary to uh, the day centre still exists, I presume. Uh, do you charge the you know the, the people <coughs> there to go to the day centres or because sometimes you know obviously the cost is something they can't afford. Uh, is there a charging mechanism in uh, just, just just briefly, what we did with that day service was that we then integrated it so that it, it had a, a wider range of interventions for people who did have a higher level of need. So it's, inter it's integrated between health and, and social work. And, it, uh, you know, I was talking about waiting lists. It actually doesn't have a waiting list because we are, uh, we are able now to help so many other people to be involved in their local community. But we don't have a charge. But, you know, that, that's a wider issue, you know, okay. charging I, I policy. Won't to, mm -hmm. I won't get into it any mm -hmm. further, but thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think Jane briefly wants to come in and then we need to move on. Yeah. Um, Again, going back to the point of it being everybody's business, I think all um, of the staff that we have working within um, the, the council and our, our partnerships really should be um, in a position to be understanding um, social isolation and being able to make those connections for people, um, not necessarily having to have um, separate um, workers who do that it should be something really that's part of everybody's role so maybe there's a, a question there about raising awareness of what social isolation is about and um, so that it isn't ignored and it's part of the the um the uh, the assessment and uh, process and the conversations that we have when we when we meet with people okay you okay Sandra? I'm fine yeah. with that. I don't know. can can we move on to john mason now thank you um, I mean, I've already touched on well, quite a range of issues, and, and transport just got mentioned uh, by somebody there um, very briefly. But I was that, that's kind of what I wanted to move on to. I mean, how much is isolation and loneliness uh, linked to, for example, lack of transport? Some of these kind of practical issues, uh, like I mean, my own mother has that experience of you know the, the challenges to getting to the taxi and then out of the taxi and, and things more than uh, anything else, uh, or. I mean, I realise there's a lot of factors in all of this, but I mean, an, another suggestion has been that that some, especially older people, are perhaps fearful of engaging with health and social work services in case they get kind of transported very quickly to a care home, which they don't actually want. So is that is that kind of balance between you know the kind of easy, well, easy, obvious practical issues and the kind of more the way people feel about it? Yeah, I I do think there's something there about. Um services having to be acceptable to um, to the individuals and and I do think think you're right there probably is a bit of a fear there of um, of, of being taken into a hospital or into care um, and we certainly know that uh, when people are looked after in their own homes the outcomes are better for them they, they aren't as disconnected from the world that they're um, that, that they're in um, so so in Going back to my original point about um, restructuring services, looking at um, pathways for for individuals in and in and out of care, we need to make sure that those are um, those support individuals to come back to their home situation or to even remain in their home situation, having having care and treatment in at the home. Somebody at home can be very isolated, although they're in their community. Somebody in hospital can also be, or a care home can also be quite isolated. How do you, how do we handle that? 
Well, I mean, I think people can be isolated in any in any circumstance. So it is about, I think, having a range of services and responses within those services to um, to meeting people's needs. It's, it, I think it's as, as simple as that of understanding what is it people people need. And we have a range of mechanisms. I mean, the third sector certainly in our area is very um, uh, very alive to the um, to social social isolation. We have a have had a, a, an ageing well programme for many years and really the primary purpose of that is, is health and well-being but it's also about that so, social um, socialisation and social connectedness um, and programmes like that look to particular groups of individuals who may be more vulnerable um, there's a directory just come out for um, for uh, men who are retiring or uh, who are retired or just about to retire to, to try to normalise this idea of yes you need to be socially connected when you're when you're older and similarly in care home settings there are activities in, in there that help to to connect people so yes I think in any um, you know it's it's you know, it's it's a human need, so we need to be able to um, to in any of our services uh, address people's need to be connected to to others in in a way that suits them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, Professor Watt. I mean, dealing with GPs. I mean, some of I don't know if are some of your hundred uh, deep end practices in rural areas then, and, and where transport and things becomes an issue. It transports an issue in the in the city. You know, resources is a part of isolation uh, for some people. I mean, the the, the uh, you know the government targets the 15% most deprived data zones. Well, that's uh, um, a large part of the Scottish population, uh, two thirds of which is registered with about 700 practices across the country. So most general practices are dealing with a bit of deprivation, including remote and rural. The thing about the deep end practices is that they're dealing with deprivation in high volume. You know, between 50 and 90 percent of their patients are living in that in that area. Uh, so uh, deprivation is a, almost across. I mean, there's about a couple of hundred practices in Scotland that don't have any patients. Uh, they probably have got a, an, an older profile. Um, the um, it's multifaceted, and you you can't form you can't produce a formula. Uh, it's based on the individual. It, it, so, sometimes it's to do with uh, uh, you know, physical isolation or, 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 or lack of, of links within within family. It's just how their life has ended up. It can be that the resources of not be, of in a community where it's difficult to get to places that maybe a, a community that doesn't have many resources to to go to. Uh, and, and then there's the very sort of fiercely independent type of person who just refuses all kinds of, of help with whom you nevertheless still have to have a relationship uh, uh, with. I think the key to it is um, everybody's different and uh, they need to be taken on their own terms and that requires really a pragmatic flexible decision making at street level based on a good knowledge of what's uh, uh, available um, somebody asked about asking people whether they were lonely there was a, a study of, of, of GP, interviews with GPs asking that and, and one of the replies was it was easier to ask about impotence than loneliness because you could do something about impotence. Uh, loneliness is much more difficult. Uh, I think that was too. Is that, is that especially GPs just feel they're so got so much to do. Well, well, well that, that's a, that's a separate I issue. I mean, I think that's too negative an issue because there are lots of things that you can do. The question is, are those things being done? Um, I uh, uh, when I took a Hollywood magazines reporter through to govern to interview three GPs, I told her afterwards that she realised there was 60 years of experience in the room. That's an enormous amount of cumulative knowledge of people. Uh, and there's a danger that we'll lose that. Uh, the stuff in the paper yesterday about the GP numbers. Uh, that, 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 that's, uh, I think there's, there's a general point that needs to be made, which is that if primary care, including general practice and all the other community-based services, isn't strong... Uh, then patients will fast track to out of hours A and E, and uh, you know to to, to dire uh, emergency situations. Uh, that's always happened to some extent in deprived areas because of resources. It's beginning to happen more widely because, as the Royal College of GPs um, keeps saying, there's been a, a disinvestment in general practice from 11 to 9 percent of the total health budget. Now that has an effect. Uh, 
over a period of time in that the system is, is, is less strong. And what I mean by strong is that uh, a whole lot of horizontal links, not fast-tracking vertically into secondary care, but are you able to contain a problem in the community, either within a consultation or by a local referral? Uh, there's various bits of information that we just lack. Um, uh, is a local health system weak or strong in that respect, in terms of its links, the, the, the knowledge and confidence that's shared between services and professions? We just don't know. I mean, at the level of, 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 at the, level of the street, you know, streetwise teams, they know what the strengths are, but the system tends not to know, and, 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 and I think is, is not necessarily investing in it. We talked about, we, we talked, we talked yes. about patient-centred care, and of course everybody's doing that, but somehow the patient isn't at the centre. Yes, I mean, and, you, and, you've argued that the health service is linked in with most people and, and it's better than anything else we've got. I mean, I just yeah. wonder if that's true of older people but not true of younger people. I mean, how well are younger people connected to the health service? Um, or is that a problem for younger people? Well, I mean, the, the, the uh, younger people are generally healthier, so they, they would. But, but there, are, there are plenty of young people with, with health problems. You know, single mothers, they're isolated and, and lonely often. Um, there, are, there are plenty of mental health problems in, 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 in younger people. But, but, but essentially, uh, um, you know, contact rates are much higher at, at old age. Uh, so that's where the, 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 the health service probably has a bigger role uh, to, to play on this question of patient-centred care, I mean the, the, the key thing is uh, what is the individual patient or person story experience like? You know, what's it like to be old in Knightswood or Leith or Aberfeldy? Uh, is it a good experience? Uh, and I think we just don't know that. And I think until you have an information system that that, that mirrors. Activity, you're not well informed and not able to improve things. I think as we move towards um, more community based integrated care, we're going to have to develop information systems that tell us how strong local systems are, where the problems are, and how things are going to be improved. Right. I mean, I think there's just so much going on here that, uh, I mean, because I'd like to broaden it out to the others as well. I mean, A, you know, are young people a bit of an issue in here? Because we've been looking at young and old, but I mean, we tend to focus maybe on the older people, it's more obvious. And then also, what about other subgroups within all of that? I mean, is there a particular issue for ethnic minority groups with uh, loneliness and isolation? What about LGBT? Uh, you know, are there other groups like that that are extra isolated? Um, just um, thinking about young people generally, um, particularly where they're facing homelessness, there's been um, various bits of work, research done to highlight issues around loneliness, um, the importance of social connection, and also there are issues there about health and um, this whole issue about access to health. And there's been um, projects, um, thinking of some in England, where they've used um, other homeless people who've um, come through that, if you like, and are prepared to volunteer as sort of buddies or work as buddies with young people to encourage them to use the health services that they so desperately need sometimes in, um, in the case of people who've been homeless and young people like that. Jane? Um, yes, uh, just um, uh, looking at the principle, I suppose, of early action, early intervention, where can we get in early in a problem or an issue? any problem or issue to make a difference um, closer to the individual and their families and their communities. Um, in, in terms of children uh, and young people, Graham um, said earlier about attachment, and, and that's a real focus of, um, of our early years work, is encouraging um, uh, parents, particularly young, more vulnerable parents, to be uh, well attached with their with their children. So, so quite a lot of our um, our services are are put in around that time to try to support. There's something as well about um, about a whole population approach to this. So, trying to make sure that that none of the vulnerable fall through the net. You know, not just offering a service out there, but of proactively going and seeking and reaching out to people rather than expecting them um, to come to come to us. So, I think that's something. Um, yes, uh, we we, um, we we have a particular example in West Lothian where we're um, working very closely in partnership with the Family Nurse Partnership, the NHS um, 
a, a targeted service for teenage mothers um, and the council has invested in its own young mother service for the other vulnerable young mothers who, 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 who don't um, fit with that particular service model. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that, n that no mother who is young and vulnerable um, goes by without one or other of the services making a really concerted effort to engage with that young person and to continue to engage with them even if it's not the right time for them uh, at that time. And also to flex around them what sort of services have we got that they might be interested in. You know, some people like group work uh, programs, other people like one to one, others, you know, others um, don't want contact all that often. So we need to be able to flex these systems to to meet the needs of of individuals in a non stigmatising way. Interesting. So, so I mean, you've got these two kind of groups or two ways of reaching vulnerable young mothers. If we take that group, um, do you, do you feel that you're reaching hundred percent or almost there? Um, we're we're not far off actually. Um, I, I can't remember offhand just how many. Um, ultimately um, turn down a service but we keep statistics and, and a, um, of, of tracking young people, uh, tracking young mothers through those, through those systems. So yes, I think we're fairly assured that we are, we are reaching out in that way um, to, to young mothers. But I think that you know, when you have a particular population that you know is made more vulnerable of all sorts of social ills, um, uh, then, then I think the trying to reach all of them in a systematic and robust and persistent way is, is, is pretty important. Thank you. Okay. 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 Briefly, the yeah. issue, uh, in the bridge project I mentioned, that was the one where practice knowledge of elderly patients was supposed to be linked to community resources for social and physical activity. Uh, anecdotally, so I don't know whether this is widely true, in Bridgeton, it was felt that immigrant and ethnic groups were much better organised in terms of social activity that could support people and the, the, the vulnerable population was the elderly white population. Yes, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, can we now move on to Annabelle? Yes, convener, you may. <laughs> um, I'm trying to sit at the top of a tree and get a bird's eye view of all this because the detail can be bewildering. And there are two aspects I'm interested in. Um, Professor Watt has already referred to this, and we've also had evidence about this as a concept of social prescribing. And I have a very simple question for you all. Is social prescribing an understood phrase? Is it in the lexicon of professionals? Um, began to look at this. Uh, we felt that it wasn't in common parlance. So actually, we initially just did a, 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 an email survey of practices to see who would respond to it, and we got, a, I think, about a 10% response. Uh, it's actually much more understood now, but, but I think the issue is not uh, understanding the term. It's whether people see it as part of their, their job to be social prescribing. And I think that, uh, uh, and I, I'm answering the question from a general practice point of view, uh, uh, not because general practice is the most important thing, but it, but it is disproportionately influential within the system that we're we're talking about. And I think social prescribing uh, implies that practices will be outward looking. They'll be thinking about themselves as the hub of a local health system and using their opportunities to develop that. Um, well, if you're totally preoccupied in a reactive way to dealing with everyday concerns, then you're just not going to be looking outside. Fine. So the issue is not understanding of the term, uh, and it's not actually understanding of what would be required, because there are models being developed all over the place of this. The real issue is, a, 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 I think, a, a resource issue of whether we're in, investing in it as a substantial uh, uh, activity. You know, the, the, the health service is 90% is of its work is in primary care, 10% uh, in hospital, but 90% of the money goes to hospital and 10% to, to primary care. The, the average spend uh, on a patient in general practice in Scotland is about £123 a year, which is almost the cost of an outpatient appointment. You know, we spend peanuts on it, and, and we can't uh, begin to imagine developing a strong primary care system uh, with that level of uh, funding. I mean, and one of the consequences of 
that is, is, you know, the community having been treated as a sink for years and years, is, is, is now full. You know, it's a bit like a flash flood. The current issue with A&E is simply because primary care has lost the capacity to absorb that it always has. And GPs are, are looking to retirement because it's not a job that they that, that, that energizes them. It, 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 it drains them, uh, uh, you know. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Up in this, on this point, convener, I wonder, Professor Watt, if I might just ask your colleagues in the panel here. I mean, is social prescribing a term on your in your lexicon? And I really just want a yes or a no. It's to try and gauge the extent to which people are aware of of this. Joe. Uh, yes, it, it it is a term. Uh, I think it is associated with healthcare and and with, with GP practice. You know, it it, it isn't. It's it's not a, a term that kind of goes more widely, and it, and and in in our in our in the local context, it, it would be very much associated with the capacity which GPs have to um, allocate a, a free you know a, a series of free sessions in in the local gym in in, in you know as as part of dealing with uh, you know a diagnosis of a particular health condition you know but we do have that facility there. And, and it is used, yeah. Yes, also we, we have an exercise referral um, scheme in West Lothian that uh, comes under the social prescribing banner. That's quite quite well used and well known. We've, we've had a number of um, initiatives over the years, so it has grown in terms of its familiarity, particularly in general practice. I, I, I think Graham and Joe are absolutely right. Um, but I think that the sea change that's coming for me now is not that it's just a phrase that's, that's used. It's that GPs now, I think, in Ayrshire are starting to want to shape what social prescribing might look like and take ownership of what the, the models that they prescribe into might look like because they recognise for all the adversity that, that, that Graham's mentioned this morning already they recognise that the current model cannot continue and so they need to find a, a, a way to promote early intervention um, for, for folks who use their services and therefore are looking to come up with models themselves of what alternatives might be to a, a, a lifetime of illness. I would say in the housing world, um, the term is probably not very well understood, but um, there is a clear focus on providing activities which could easily be linked in with um, social prescribing. So things like walking groups that are being organised, craft cafes, activities like that, which are particularly well suited to helping on the loneliness and health front. Professor Watt, coming back to you, and I've listened with care to your very justifiable concerns about... Um, the problems of structure and, and resource and capacity to deal with um, either delivering or trying to implement um, a policy of social prescription. But can I ask this question? I mean, it seems to me, going back to what you were saying about the coverage of the NHS, and I think what we now know to be from the projects of which we're aware, like Deep End and Links, that patients do have a confidence in their GP possibly born out of um, a reassurance that the GP is to be trusted and can assist. Does this mean that we should maybe be considering for GPs a patient protocol of social prescribing? The, uh, that, um, I, I often quote uh, Mr... Or no. <laughs> well, n well, 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 no. Uh, and the answer, I, I often quote Mr. Spock from Star Trek talking to Captain Kirk. He says, it's not logical, Captain. There's so much hu human behaviour is not logical. That means that you can't uh, produce a logic plan or a formula or a protocol that predicts what's going to happen. You, 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 the thing about um, general practice is it's unconditional. It responds to whatever the patient brings or their circumstances. That's the only almost the only part of the public service that is unconditional. And that requires uh, knowledge, continuity, pr pragmatism, good conscience. Uh, I think uh, a protocol implies that this is a thing that can be managed. And I think it's as much a cultural development as a managerial development. And that's to do with hearts and minds and, and values. Uh, well, it, it, yeah. Given that it seems that there's possibly not an even pattern of awareness amongst the GP profession. Um, and that's not a criticism, that's just, you know, um, a statement of, of reality. Um, given that, 
Is there more that perhaps could be done at the GP level? Because of the core asset which the GP is to the local community, is there something more that could be done to assist GPs in having on the radar screen social prescribing? Um, yes, I mean, and, and, and it's not just information, it's not just flags on the, on the screen. Um, um, you need to have, a, from a practitioner point of view, you need to know who you're referring to. Do you have trust? Do you have trust in yes. them? I mean, the, yes. whole, the whole question of, of, of trust, I think, is based. It's based on positive experiences and confidence that they will be continued. So there needs to be continuity. Uh, a huge resource. When people retire, they take all that with them. That's a real hazard that we we, we face. One of the things that. I think the deep end project has been important uh, for is this, it has engaged with practices and on the projects that, we that we've been able to get involved with. It's put them on the front foot. They're not reacting to things that other people have imagined and say, please do this, do that. Uh, that's a very important so development. Question. Is that a model which could be commended to the medical profession in Scotland? Because I appreciate the projects to which you refer have only been able to cover certain geographies. Yes. Well, the, I mean, I, I would uh, be, 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 uh, be very uh, careful at the present time uh, not to be prescribing more things that general practice should do. You know, unless there were resources to help them do, do it. Uh, that would be my, my first caveat. So uh, uh, principle from yeah. practice. What yeah. I'm trying to get at no, is... I, 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 absolutely. And what I think I'm trying I, to get at, but, Professor but, but, Watt, is what is a good principle? And then you're absolutely right. Before you contemplate implement yeah. or application of the principle, yeah. of course you must have resource and structure and yeah. process in place. But uh, I think uh, we're I, interested I, as a committee uh, to think, know what's uh, good principle. I think the principle is that... Um, general practices, because of the features that are described, are the natural hubs of local health systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but hubs don't go anywhere unless they're connected by spokes to the rest of the wheel. That's mm -hmm. the rest of the table mm -hmm. here. So there's, there's building that needs to be done there. There's a leadership role for practices, uh, um, which needs to be uh, valued and supported. Uh, one of the issues uh, within primary care is it's a highly disaggregated system. There's a thousand general practices in Scotland. They often don't know what's happening down the road in the next practice, never mind the other side of the country. So the whole issue of sharing good experience and learning from it is something that is under-supported. Uh, uh, the system it operates as a thousand small boats as opposed to a, an armada sailing in the right directions. Uh, I've just come back from a, a meeting in Vermont. Yeah. Professor yeah. Watt, other professions, albeit they may range hugely in size of practice unit, mm. um, do manage to observe some kind of um, collective fraternity or sorority, as with the yeah. Equal Opportunities Committee, um, in, in terms of sharing professional experience and advice. I mean, that might be done through their professional journal. It might be done through uh, the professional website. Um, so why are doctors different? Um, well... Uh, I'm, uh, it's, it's big, I mean, you, you, your question is actually uh, a, a very deep question. Um, uh, what, what do you say about uh, sharing evidence and, uh, and, uh, uh, and experience is most true in the hospital side in established specialties like diabetes or in heart disease? I mean, there's international conferences and, and gravy trains for all of that. Um, uh, many of our institutions and our research and our teaching is based on that vertical model, based on, on problems, not people. Uh, a GP is an expert in a community. You know, he's a, an Easter houseologist or a particleologist. He knows a, a little about a lot, and his expertise is to make pragmatic uh, decisions around a, a, around, a great deal. <laughs> around, 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 well, uh, I mean, I, think, I mean, our ambition is, is that is that people should stop saying, "Oh, you just want to be a GP." Actually, it's, being a GP is a hugely important job at the front line of the health service. But the nature of the work, its unconditionality, its continuity, are, are difficult to research and to produce evidence. That's why the Deep End Project, in the absence of much evidence from deprived areas, has capitalised on the experience and views of practitioners. And the gap that we filled 
is the infrastructure that allows people to share experience and views. It's, it's enormously empowering for the individuals to find out that they're in the same boat. And it's a very effective intervention because uh, a professional group within itself can challenge itself and move forward, I think, more easily than being criticised from outside. But, Professor yeah. Watt, I think the whole committee is fully supportive of GPs and yes. admire greatly the job that they do throughout Scotland, is trying to work out a way in which we take that asset, which yeah. is undisputed, yeah. and help it to enhance its contribution yeah. to, Absolutely. The, to the community. Well, I, 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 th I, mean, I was saying I was in Vermont last week, and, and they had 10 years ago invented, really, a, because they didn't have it, a, a, infrastructure, really a learning organisation for their family practices. I mean, it's very different, obviously, the states from here. But what was interesting was that, was that they now have infrastructure that is dedicated to what you've just described. Whereas the health service that we've got has got a, a, a general management philosophy and in infrastructure. And at the community level, it's mainly based around managing area-based services, whereas general practice has always been independent of that, and the system has always had difficulty in engaging with general practice, which generally takes a back foot and doesn't get involved. The challenge is that I think general practice has to be on the front foot, and that will mean things like protected time for sharing activity, for, for leadership. Uh, all of our projects are based on the primary care collaborative model, which was the most successful initiative in engaging practices, where they tended to work in clusters of five or six on, on work of their own choosing with protected time for sharing experience with a role for GP leadership which would allow their experience to be communicated to, to others. In a sense, what you're doing is you're building uh, a learning organisation, infrastructure that historically has not I I existed. Uh, I think that we, 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 we can't just have a thousand flowers blooming. You know, They have to be connected in some uh, organised yeah. way. Sorry, can I just interrupt? We're running out of time and I've also got two other uh, witnesses want to contribute to this conversation as well. So can we move on to Joe and then David to give their input to your question as well, Annabelle, please? Joe. Yeah, I, I just think briefly, I, I think uh, GPs, important as they are, are not in and of themselves a solution to the to, to the. The, the, the challenge and the problem that, that, that they are part of the solution if they actually work well in, in a locality you know in a whole system approach within each locality really so so actually um, establishing the connect the connectivity between the GP and other services but also their knowledge and awareness which I think Graham has, has, has pointed to their awareness of what's available in their locality in terms of the third sector you know so so information and, and the flow of information the use of new technologies to actually create you know deliver the information in, in, a, in a readily accessible format is important for all parts of the system but it's also important to actually have information available so that people can actually be um, self-managing can actually find the information they need without in fact ever going to a GP or, or, or to any other service because many people won't go you know they, they, they won't they won't go to, to, to service and David Th thank you very much um, I, I think for me the, the beauty of general practice is the relationship the relationship between the GP and, 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 and their patient and that's a relationship that can often last 20 30 40 years and I think if we if we were to move to protocolize general practice we'd run the real risk of breaking that relationship. And I think through um, the, the, the open approach that general practice has to providing care and assessing need um, leads us to a situation where they can truly inform the future direction of health and social care. And I think that's where the new health and social care partnerships come to the fore. Through the locality planning structures that we're going to have to establish over the coming year to two years, through engaging local communities, local practitioners at all levels, including general practitioners, in conversations about what are the needs of the local communities and how can those needs best be met and how can resources best be allocated to meet those needs. That's how we'll bring the standardisation across GP practices within those localities and hopefully embed things like social prescribing within, within the localities as well. So they are, they're targeted at and tailored to local need. I'm neatly to my final yeah, question, yeah, convener, you, which yeah. is this whole issue of social isolation in relation to the integration plans required under the 2014 Act. 
Are you satisfied that social, social um, isolation is again on the radar screen when, when these plans are being drawn up? And what I'm satisfied is that the opportunity is there, and, and then what will actually, you know, be important is, is how is that opportunity actually translated into into reality and into change. And the opportunity is there because the national integration outcomes are, are you know, actually are, are, there's a clarity there around the importance of well-being and and supporting well-being, not simply providing you know care uh, to the best of your ability, but actually promoting well-being, which isn't necessarily about being in, involved. In care, the national integration outcomes emphasise, you know, prevention, um, uh, 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 supporting people not to be involved in services, and that's actually, I think, where they give the opportunity. And there's also a, a, a legislative, a statutory obligation to report on what is happening locality by locality. And so, again, the opportunity is there to, to actually demonstrate that third sector are you know, fully involved and that they are actually being resourced to provide the, the contribution that, that, that they know that they, that they can make in each locality. Okay. David, uh, well, we'll go for it. Uh, just to say that um, thinking about locality planning, then I think it's really important that housing is involved in this as well as local um, voluntary services, voluntary organisations. And of course, that's something that we're still watching around the country to see how that's going to pan out. But um, housing organisations are very clear about the contribution that they can make to this process and should be around the table. Um, and obviously, their links with the voluntary sector are very important in all of this. Okay. Are you okay? Just, Joe, you said, you know, it's an opportunity. Um, is that an opportunity that we're confident is being recognised by all health boards and local authorities? Uh, well, I, 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 you know, as I would have to say, it's kind of maybe difficult for me to kind of, you know, express an opinion across all health boards and local authorities, certainly in the area that I'm working in. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm completely confident that, you know, that, that this is very high on the agenda and is, is, is recognised, yeah. Um, yes, Briefly, I would agree um, very much with that. I think there's a range of um, uh, of opportunities around for for um, for us in the service areas to um, to be providing more joined up, more flexible, and um, services that intervene earlier. Yes, for sure. Or the same. Well, I, uh, what I was going to say was I, I absolutely recognise the opportunities as Joe's described them, and what I want to provide some reassurance to, to the committee today is that we've actually translated that into a clear commitment within our strategic plan. Uh, one of our five um, strategic priorities is to improve mental health and well-being. And whilst out to co consultation on that plan, that was the priority that got the warmest uh, welcome from the local population and was given the highest priority by them in terms of the feedback we received. So it's there, it's explicit, our commitment to the local population and social isolation and loneliness fits right up the middle of that. So it's very, very high on our agenda. Thank, 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 you. Very, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we're moving on now to the topic of sheltered housing for older people on the 13th of March. One of the witnesses actually described the lack of sheltered housing for older people as a demographic time bomb. And the appeal of sheltered housing is that it can provide community support uh, without taking away the person's independence. Do you think that is a way to actually combat social isolation? Is that possible or as we also actually heard as well that you could be in a nursing home surrounded by people every day, 24 hours a day, but you could still be lonely and ask if it first. Yes, in terms of sheltered housing, I think we need to recognise that the sheltered housing model is going through change and has been for a few years. And so what we tend to traditionally think of as of housing for older people with um, a resident ward, and that's really moved on to um, flexible services coming in and out, uh, a recognition about the role of those um, services as hubs, as we've heard already from North Ayrshire and from, I know from South Lanarkshire's Council's experience as well, moving on to thinking about serving communities more broadly. Um, but in terms of whether there should be more of it, then I think it's a, a, perhaps a bigger issue about um, analysing what it is that people desire, what sort of aspirations they have as they come up to older age, what choices are they likely to, to make if that um, option is available. And um, generally speaking, as I say, the uh, traditional sheltered housing has been going through 
um, a period of reconfiguration. So what I would suggest is rather than just reproducing um, the traditional model, then looking more broadly about people's aspirations and needs, but recognising some of the very valuable aspects of the traditional model, that feeling of security, people moving in, choosing to go into that sort of service because they felt there was some security there, that there would always be somebody on call, that there would be a support worker that they would know, whether they called that a warden or a support worker or a housing manager. Um, so some of those elements, as well as the option of socialising near their home, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of the communal areas that are typically part of sheltered housing. We've been hearing how much of a problem community transport is and how limiting um, physical and sensory um, issues are as people get older it is harder for them to go far and so having that option of a communal area where they can organize um, events organize activities share common interests is so important so um, definitely we should be looking at that as um, continuing to be an option for people okay um David, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I, I would very much like to echo what, what, what Yvette said. I, I think um, I think it is about the individual, you know, and, and I think it's about respecting what the individual wants to see um, and, and the choices they want to make in their life. Um, for some people to put them in, into a shelter housing complex would be completely isolating because it takes them away from, from their community network. Um, and we mustn't do that. We must find um, a, a way to support individuals at home for as long as possible so that they can continue to access that, that network that they've established over years and years and years. For others, a move into a sheltered housing complex is going to be um, the, right, the right decision. It's going to be a new lease of life. It's going to open up new social doors to them. And I think it's about recognising that as well. So I, I think that my point is it's not a panacea. Yeah, I think we need a multi-pronged approach to, to how, how we, 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 we address this issue going forward. Um, and, and this is one real viable option for us, and it's important that we get the capacity right, because your previous contributor is absolutely correct. If, if we don't get the capacity right, um, then it will be a time bomb for us. But, but it's about recognising that it's not right for everyone. Um, we're actually running short of time, so can I ask you to condense your answers from now on? I've got two other members that would like to come in to ask questions, and um, we'll move on now to John Finney. Well, thank you, Convener. Um, it's, a, it's a question for Ms Burgess, and it's about um, the unwitting um, loneliness, social isolation that can happen when housing providers perhaps put uh, young homeless people in inappropriate accommodation or a accommodation that transpires to be inappropriate and likewise when they're given tenancy of a, a, a house without the necessary skills to maintain that tenancy of the doorkeeping skills and all the rest is there a growing awareness of that or how has that been tackled please I think in terms of um, what we're talking about really is the support that people might need, young people particularly who've never experienced a tenancy before and haven't be had a chance to develop the life skills needed to get on with neighbours etc um, the legislation we have now around homelessness does um, include obviously the um, requirement that local authorities assess somebody's housing support needs when they're homeless and that includes young people so there is a growing awareness I think um, at that stage about the support needs that a young person might have and then a duty to make provision for that support so um, I think the support is essential housing support um, service will typically look at issues around social skills, will look at things like life skills development. An important part of that will be looking at their social network. Does that need to be um, encouraged and um, boosted up? Or perhaps there's an issue there about somebody deciding that really they have to move away from their existing social circle. It might be because of drugs, alcohol issues, um, and that can lead to a lot of isolation for a young person or for anybody else going through that. And so that's where some formal support can really help to um, see that person through to making other social contacts to prevent the isolation then that can so often lead to further problems. So um, I hope that's answered your question to some extent. It is, thank you. That, that, that's reassuring. And, and a, a question, if I may, for the, the panel generally, and it is about, we've heard a lot about the use of social media and technology. Now, 
whilst accepting that there are a range of skills within our community, in fact, there are a range of opportunities because of the technical um, limitations on some areas, what part can that play in reducing um, loneliness and social isolation? Please. John. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I think there are two, two strands, really. Uh, you know, so one is actually enabling people who may be actually digitally excluded, don't have you know, the, the, ability, the, the, the knowledge and the experience, the grandchildren to show them how to do it. You know. um, so, so, so that, that is, is a piece of work that is, is important to actually address, really, that in, in each area there should be access for people who currently don't use um, you know, don't use this not out of choice, but because they don't know how to use an iPad to stay in touch with, um, you, you know, relatives, contacts who are a long distance away, and and wh where we've actually you know set out to do that, there has been an uptake for that. You know, so it isn't the case that people are saying, I'm not interested in that. I don't. You know, when we actually speak to people, they say, I I, I actually they understand the concept of being excluded. You know, they they actually feel left behind because you know they they know. You know, everybody now knows someone, knows other people who actually are using these these media as part of their day to day lives. So, not being able to do it is an issue for 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 many people. And so, so there has to be that uh, offer there, and and that doesn't just involve social work, or it, it might it, it's actually just as an important part of a library function um, in, in, in 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 any kind of public service. So offering that so that people can actually have the, have the capacity. The second area is actually developing you know, the web-based um, information uh, you know, portals, actually giving people access to the information. And because, <clears throat> again, um, it, it's, it's too easy to say, well, no, there are lots of people in the group that we're talking about, older people who don't actually access the, the, the internet. Um, there, you know, that may be the case, but actually, increasingly, they are accessing the internet. But also, their their, their children, their their families, they, they have connections in order to, to help them to do that. So, the development of uh, you know a, 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 the website a, a approach, which again, just in, in terms of example, we have a website called Making Life Easier, which actually gives people a range of options to um, to you know the kind of example would be to access low level supports. So people who don't see themselves as service users of, of any service, people see themselves as, as consumers, you know, uh, and, and, and actually wouldn't, you know, the point I think earlier, some people don't want to be, to be referred to a social work service because they think the next thing that will happen is they're in a care home and they will say to their family, no, don't, you know, on, on no account are you to, to make a, a contact with social work service. But actually, they'll be perfectly happy for their family to, to, to look up a website where they can get access to, uh, to a range of low level supports without in fact requiring to ever become a, 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 a you know a, a, a service user of, of, of a service you know so so those the two things giving people the capacity to use this where they don't have, have have the social media capacity at the moment but also then having the right information available at, at you know at the local level that people are actually able to get not not just accessing a, a, a national level you know generic uh, database but actually here's what avail here's what's available in 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 Cotebridge, and, 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 and we've actually got that up to date for you to use. Thank you. I don't know if any other panel members wish to comment. I mean, is, is there a danger that, uh, that in cash strap times this would become an alternative to actually seeing the whites of the eyes of a, an actual human coming to assist you? <coughs> I would say, on the contrary, what it, what it, what it, what, what it does is, is it, it allows those people who do need uh, the face-to-face -face contact, it allows them to get access to that more readily because you, you know you, you're actually um, you know you, you, you're actually um, getting the kind of um, self-screening, if you like, you know, and 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 also the that website can actually allows self-assessment and allows the, the the website itself to actually say. Uh, at a certain point in terms of the person answering self-assessment questions, actually what we would suggest to you is that you should come in and see us because actually the information you've given us now is telling us that, you, you, that you, the solution isn't one that's available without you actually getting that kind of support. Thank you. As well, just to make the point that in terms of housing support work, then the use of technology I think is increasingly important and particularly um, 
from the point of view of the person using the service and um, having some support to use the various bits of technology around them increasingly, whether that's a community care alarm, whether it's access to the internet and using Skype or just using information systems. But that's for some people, their support worker will be a good person to help to introduce them into all of that. And I think it's important increasingly that support workers and care workers feel confident about the range of technology technology available and increasingly um, can help people in this situation. I think the, the ultimate <clears throat> aim is that individuals are knowledgeable and confident in the problems that they've got and in accessing resources available to them. You know, Self-help and self-management uh, are desirable, but for many people they're not a starting point. If they are a starting point and they just need the information through IT and whatever, then that's great because it, hopefully will take them out of the need for services. But there's a very important and substantial part of the population for whom self-help and self-management are a distant destination. And for them, a, a long-term productive relationship, a journey, if you like, is what's re required. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, a supplementary Sorry, from... I just, I just wanted to come in on a supplementary. I had a very interesting presentation at the cross-party group and older people yesterday. I don't know if you've heard about this one. Uh, University of Southampton and Kent and RBS uh, here in Scotland are sponsoring it and it's a virtual uh, reality, it's an avatar have you heard about that one? It's an avatar which people who uh, you know, in care homes, all their information goes in to this you know, tablet and uh, basically I think they're going to protocol it by 2020 and it seems to be that you can call up anything from a warden to your doctor, etc. I wonder if anyone had heard of that. It's certainly been a new one to me. I'm sorry to spring it on you, but in June there's going to be a presentation about it, and it seemed very futuristic. To, and as John has said, if it moves on, and they were hoping to have that embodied in the health service, the cost of, uh, you know, in the health service. And there's a film Avatar, and if 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 if, 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 if you've seen it. The, the technology and the graphics are fantastic and, and the story is, is very, very weak. And I think we need to concentrate on the story rather than the technology. Yeah, of the person, Avatar, that's yeah. what it's called, an yeah. Avatar. Can, no? we, can we move on now to Christian, but can I ask you to, when you're sort of giving these your answers, can you also try and remember to bring in young people in social isolation? Because we've actually spoke quite a bit about elderly people and young people are really important as well. So, moving on to Christian now, thank you. Thank you very much, Kavina. Uh, I was going to ask about uh, how we can uh, find further opportunities for joint working in the third sector to combat social isolation and loneliness, but I would like to come back on something regarding your joint working. From the first of this month, uh, services, health services, and social services have been integrated, and I'm a bit surprised with some of the contribution this morning. You know, we are not uh, at the time of uh, opportunities, designing opportunities for this integration. We are, we are at the time of implementation. Uh, have we, have we seen some of the implementation already? Have we seen some of the results already? And if you are not, it may be time that, that, that we do. I, um, I suppose I would be very clear that uh, the, the integration, um, the process of integration, the delivery of integrated care and support has actually been an evolving process which has actually doesn't start with with the legislation you know so so a lot of the things that i've been talking about today have been happening over many many years and the the, the legislation takes us into a new uh, a, a new stage a new a new stage of that evolution and i, I agree with you you know that, that we, it has to be about implementation um, the the locality dimension of the legislation is new, you know, the, the, the insistence, with, quite rightly so, within the legislation that um, 
we, we have to actually evidence within not just within a partnership area but within that partnership with for each locality how are you responding to the needs of the that uh, population that geographical population within within your your localities and and that's i think where there will be there will be scope and opportunity for new design work that perhaps you know perhaps hasn't been as to the, much to the fore as it has been up till now but but I agree you know we have to move into implementation stage yes just just I, I would very much agree with uh, with what Joe's saying there that that um, integration moving towards joint working working within community planning partnerships um, is is not uh, it's not new to to any of us and, and a lot of the work that we've been doing in fact I can't think of any work that that our services do in complete isolation from any from anyone else the um, we've we're moving out of the silos that we perhaps were in maybe 10 15 years ago um, uh, very much with a with a view to what's the opportunity to engage to to work in partnership um, and I think this is this is an evolutionary journey for us that um, that uh, new policy and legislation is um, is uh, promoting um, also um, in, in terms of, again mentioning ch children and families the the getting it right for every child um, agenda has been has been around for quite some time now and um, ourselves and other local authority areas have been um, very much looking to the principles of getting it right for every child for a number of years and particularly the the, the notion of coming around the individual how do you how do you how do you um, flex your services and and structure your your response in such a way that you're coming around the child um, um, some we've had some opportunities for that um, recently uh, in the area of mental health and well-being for for young people again thinking about not just young people who have mental health problems but those who are made more vulnerable emotionally and, and mentally by their experiences so that whole spectrum of of early vulnerability all the way up to to young people with really quite um profound difficulties and how do you then bring the services around the table to um, around that child to see how best can we support this young person and it's not always about putting a service in sometimes it's about the the services coming together and saying well the young person has a relationship with this particular person how do we support that person with this particular level of need that that young person has so it might be about consultancy or training for that individual member of staff so it's really about that building on the relationships that people have with children and young people how best can we support that rather than pinging them off into another another service and another service so it's even not as a as patient centered but as person centered and and getting it right for every child is exactly the kind of thing which should have been implemented and and now we've from the first of april as you say there is a, a lot of collaboration and joint working so we have everything in place uh, but it's not working as much as it should be for young people yet is what you are saying we are still a bit lacking behind M maybe some some parts the gps for example are not as much as involved as they should be well i think it's about you know, if, if we could have gotten this, this right easily, we would have done it a long time ago. It's a really complex area that we're in here around social care and health care. And, um, you know, the evidence is, is, is around these days that really does point out just how complex our, our, our makeup is as, a, as, as human beings. We're very complex creatures and it's and, and and social ills don't don't come alone either. There's not an easy solution to any of these things. So I think it's and also, you know, when we do have have some answers and some solutions, often they're very much part of what's going on at the time and and in conjunction with a whole range of other of other things. So so it's about having a it's a, it's a really complex understanding that we require to have, um, and I think we. What I'm liking these days is the is the opportunity to that I think there's there's more of a shared understanding across um, social care, across education, NHS about the issues and the problems. We're not siloed in our professionalisms anymore, and the challenge is how and the opportunity is how do we make that happen on the ground in a way that really works for for people in our communities. I think we have a lot of good practice, a lot of good practice. Some of it's still in pockets. So the challenge for us is how do we then grow that um, 
and, and offer that out? How do we work in collaboration, not just um, within our local authority areas, but across Scotland in order to do that? And I, I do think it's a very exciting um, time to be doing this work. If it. Um, just to add to that, really, that thinking about young people and thinking about housing services and just recognising that it, it won't necessarily be the case that integration encompasses all the services that um, young people will need to come into contact. So really just a plea to remember that housing and um, housing support services, hostel services, those working with particularly young people going through transition, whether they're coming out of care or whether they're homeless or both, um, that the links need to be um, continue, um, regardless of whether um, a partnership decides to include homelessness um, and the services that particularly affect young people in the partnership or not, that we really need to build on the, the existing links and improve them, um, rather than just expect that integration in itself will magically deal with the um, issues. Have you been involved in these two uh, pieces of legislation? So the right of every child and the, the, the integration of, so, uh, of social services and health services? Yes, yeah. Come in, but can you make it very brief and then John Mason as well briefly, John? Please. Getting a right for every child doesn't actually mention in general practice, even though practices have a lot of knowledge about families, which is important. The health and social care integration, obviously important, but preoccupied with the integration of two rather different bureaucracies. It will take a lot of time for that to to iron it, 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 itself out. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, so often we pass the written and fail the practical, so the strategies and the policies are fine. It's delivering it that's the I issue. I go back to what I said earlier on about dysfunctional, fragmented services. You know, Spike Milligan described a man who invented a machine that did the work of two men but took three men to work it. Well, that's health and social care. We need to imagine ways of doing the same thing with smaller numbers of people. And at the end of the day, the gold standard is going to be what's it like for the individual patient? What, has their experience been good? Does the family feel that their relative has been dealt with well? That will be the test of whether the, the bureaucracies are working well together. Thank you. But it's really, uh, especially on social isolation and loneliness, it's yes. about the person first and foremost. Before, the, of, the, the, in fact, the person becomes a patient when it's failure of, of the services. Uh, quite. Mason, briefly, yeah, point, intervention. I, mean, I agree very much with Ms Burgess about the importance of housing. Uh, I was slightly surprised in, in one of the comments in your paper where it said uh, about housing organisations might include helping a person relocate nearer friends, family or support. I mean, that would be great, but I mean, my experience is it doesn't happen. It's incredibly <laughs> difficult to get somebody to move to a particular location? Um, it's the issue about allocation policies. And yes, there's huge pressure, as we all know, on social rented housing. But um, many organize, housing organisations do give additional points. I mean, we're still um, working generally with point systems for allocating properties, but we'll give points for social isolation. An example is uh, trust housing, for instance, that gives um, additional points depending on how many times a week or a month somebody has um, a visit from a friend or a family member. Um, however, as you say, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who needs to move closer to family and friends is then um, given that opportunity when they want it. Thank you. Christian? <laughs> Yes, uh, another point we, which we, we, we talked a lot about when we took evidence, and I can see a distribution from West London Committee Health and Care Partnership talking about uh, um, high-profile campaigns, and particularly the one, uh, the one from an organisation like Age Scotland, which really gave a lot of media coverage and, uh, and, uh, and are very accessible to, 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 to the population at large. And do you think we should have that kind of national campaign? And if it is, this national campaign should be targeted as a people who could become patient, who could, who could be affected, or more generally uh, at, at the whole of the committees and maybe trying to build a committee resilience or something else? You know, what, what would be your ideas on a national campaign? Jane, would you like to comment? My own opinion about cam national campaigns is quite often they're based around the negative. 
And I would be suggesting that uh, any national campaign would be around social connectedness rather than disconnection. David? David, I, 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 I would agree ent entirely with that. And I think if, if there could be a very positive message around social connectedness that, that then laid the foundations, if you like, for locality-based planning to understand um, the, the needs of, of, of particular communities and how we might respond effectively to that in light of that, that, that wider campaign about social connectedness, I think that, that would be really helpful. Uh, Graham, briefly, yeah. And then Joe, do you want to come in as well? Yeah. I think that uh, the you know, politicians have great difficulty in closing hospitals because of the public emotional commitment to hospitals. But the service we need in the future can't be based on hospitals. So the national campaign that I would like to see is one that that convinces the, and, and engages with the public, saying that what the NHS is about in the future is not just hospitals. It's about living well and long in the community. So that actually if, if resource is being transferred from secondary care to primary care, it's a good thing not something that's being lost, it's something that's being gained. I think un unless the public sign up to that, then we're going to be tied in forever into the wrong model. And just briefly, the, yeah. I, I think national campaign, the, the, the challenge there is, is how do you get a message that is actually relevant in every part of, you know, of, 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 of the target audience and really, uh, you know, the, the, the local level is where I think some of the answers are to be found for the questions mm -hmm. we're talking about here today. So it would just be a note of caution about, okay. uh, about the, the national campaign approach. Really. Yvette? to ask the question, but I, I wanted answers, if it was possible, of how can we do it, a, a, a national one, and, and, and staying positive. Yvette? Yes, I would suggest it's about um, public image and perceptions and cherry, um, challenging stereotypes. So thinking particularly about older people and anything to promote the idea of older people being active, doing things, contributing, um, all of those positive um, examples I think really encourage people, encourage older people themselves to get on and do these things and it encourages others who are in contact with older people whether that's as neighbours or grandchildren or whoever um, to think of them as having that potential. Should it be gender targeted, age targeted? Um, I think that's a very good question. I think try and do something which is um, quite broad ranging um, but I mean it is a fact that for instance older um, men can feel particularly isolated. I'll give an example, um, Queen's Cross Housing Association realised that there were a, a group of old, uh, uh, men over 60 who weren't engaging in any of their services and they realised that actually it was because they perceived the existing group activities, I think it was around sheltered housing, as being predominantly for women and so that encouraged um, Queen's Cross Housing Associations, they recognised that, they set up the, a group they called the STAG group for, for men to particularly get involved. So um, I do think you've got a point about thinking about, well, which of those groups um, in that uh, wider group of older people need particular encouragement to think about being, um, continuing to be act act active and sociable. You wanted to come in? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to see a stratified national campaign, if I'm being really honest, um, and I think it, it harks back to the point I made and the, and the point that Joe made as well. I think a, 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 a high-level national campaign focusing on, on key positive messages like social connectedness is absolutely a great thing for us to do and, and would really, really welcome that. I think the true understanding of, of, of um, how to stratify that, that message at a local level should come from a, a sense of, of, of where the priorities lie locally and would therefore be looking for you to leave that, that to us within the, the evolving health and social care partnerships to, to take that national message and turn it into something really positive locally. Age. It's easy for the general population to understand that older people can be isolated. It's maybe not so easy to understand that young people can be isolated. Is there a way we could do that nationally? Well, I, I, I guess then you know that that maybe gives a lead into a theme for a national campaign, which would be 
you know, uh, highlighting that this, in fact, is an issue across the entire life cycle, you know, and, 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 and so that it's not, so that would be a very high level message, you know, but, it, but you know, I, I think there have been other campaigns, you know, around mental health issues, for example, in the past, which have, you know, really kind of, you know, pressed home this message that mental health is an issue for everybody, you know, you're, you're, you're standing in the supermarket beside people who have got mental health difficulties and, and, and I think that some of those have been quite powerful emotional content messages um, and so perhaps there, 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 would, there could be a role you know, to, to actually raise the, the profile in terms of social isolation as being everybody's issue because also it's not just you know you're not simply you know doing a national campaign to highlight or to develop awareness of this that this happens that it exists but it's also aware, awareness amongst the wider community around what it is that they can actually contribute or what what they can do in in terms of actually um, finding you know um, making a contribution really as, as part of their community Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank you all for coming along this morning and sharing your information, your experience, your knowledge with us? It's been really, really useful. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will take place in Isla on the 11th of May, where the committee will take further evidence on its inquiry into age and social isolation. And I formally close the general open part of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much.